Michael Oliver from OliverMSA.com joins us today to talk about silver and its momentum structured moves to look for. This and more on this week's episode of Metal Money. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Michael Oliver, welcome to Metal Money. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Patrick, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Glad to have you on, Michael. First time we get a chance to talk to you. Michael, you've developed your own momentum-based method of technical analysis in the 1980s. Can you briefly explain how your way of technical analysis differs from the conventional way of technical analysis? Sure. Most people look at price charts and uh, you know they draw lines on them, uptrend lines, flat lines, so forth and so on, looking for breakouts. Uh, and sometimes they'll overlay a moving average on it. You know, even in the Wall Street Journal, you see the S&P with a 65-day average or whatever, you know. Uh, we do that too, but then what we do, our next step is to take the price and the moment and the moving average, whichever one we use, we may maybe a very long-term average, like a 36-month, which we call annual momentum, meaning three years average, or a three-quarter, you know, last three quarters of a year, that average changes every quarter, you know. Uh, or we we could get down to daily stuff too for micro analysis, but generally we're focused on intermediate to long term, and so we tend to use averages that have some duration to them, uh, three quarters of a year, three years, that kind of thing. What we then do is we plot the price bars instead of just on a price chart with the overlay of the average. We use the average as a zero line, and so price is either above that zero line or it's below that zero line. So you oscillate it. We create an oscillator using the average. And that way we see different type of movement in that given market in its relationship to not just some price level, but in relation to that moving average, how much over, how much under. And when we plot that, over time we see different trend situations setting up visually on the oscillator that you may not see and probably don't see on the price chart. And usually when a trend changes, I would say almost all the time, momentum will turn first. You'll see a trend break, an uptrend line breakdown, or a flat floor breakthrough before you see the same type of thing occurring on the price chart. So it, to some extent, it's advantageous because it, it gives you an edge, gives you a warning. And uh, right now, one of the markets we're most excited about, both fundamentally but especially technically, is uh, silver. Yeah, that, that's interesting because I've heard you mention in other interviews that your quarterly momentum chart for silver, it is your favorite right now. So let's go ahead and start with that. What are your charts showing you about silver right now? Well, what it let's go back a bit. Let's go back to 2019, 18, 17. Silver was in the, in the doldrums, depressed, underperforming gold, very low price levels up and down, but not able to get out of the hole, okay? Just before it took off, it had that last plunge in March of 2020, dropped you down to about $11. And it turned and burned like a rocket because when we ran annual momentum of silver back then, we saw a different picture than we saw on the price chart. We saw a massive ceiling, flat, a flat ceiling above. It wasn't quite so clear on silver. And we burst through it, and by the time it burst through it at about $19, within literally weeks, it was nearly 30. So, you know, it, it, it went from the, the teens to 30 in a matter of a couple months, actually. And it did it because it broke out of a massive annual momentum base. And since then, now this would be the mid-2020 time period. So it ran up, got to near 30. And then it leveled off into a range, a boring range, basically from just below 22, up to 30, back to 22, up to, you know, et cetera. And then over the last, uh, since especially this summer, which is when the Fed came out and said, we're going to taper, you know, we're going to get tough. Okay, right. And everybody believed them. Okay, fine. Well, maybe it's true. But if you look at gold and silver, they got bashed and they got bashed and they got bashed all during that time period. But each of the sell-offs were redundant, meaning, yeah, you'd beat it up, gold would go down, silver would go down, then they come back up again, you know, about the way you sold it. Then they go down again. Come back. You, you couldn't get a sustained downside going with the, despite multiple selling episodes from mid-June last year through late last year. 
Silver has repeatedly come back down to the $22 level on price, nipped it out a bit. We thought, frankly, that maybe it would go down and hit 21 just to clear the decks, if you know what I mean. Because there's so many lows that occurred at around 22, going back to summer of 2020, that maybe we needed to flush it out, run the stops. But they wouldn't go to 22. They went to 2150, okay? So, and now you're back up to 24. Well, over the time that silver's been doing this up-down with sort of a slight downward staircase, and not really on the price charts, you don't really get a good trend structure to define where, you know, there's a trend line. You could say, oh boy, there's a, there's a structure. If we can get above it, we could take off. But when you look at quarterly momentum, annual momentum gave you the original buy in 2020. Then you've been oscillating above that level since. But quarterly momentum is when you measure price, in this case, weekly bars, in their relationship to a three-quarter moving average, which only changes once every quarter. You adjust it, okay? It's similar in duration to a 200-day average, okay? Anyway, we plot that, and we ended up with the chart, and you can show your, your viewers later, the, an oscillator that continues to come up to the same level at the zero line, in other words, from below, the momentum readings. What that means is the price of silver has repeatedly come up and hit the three-quarter moving average from below and been unable to close a week out above it ever since breaking below it late last summer. And it's done it now three times since it broke below it last summer. It's bumped the zero line three times, so you have a perfect horizontal structure that you cannot see on a price chart. So we have what we call a beautiful ceiling, a pending breakout structure. Normally, when momentum establishes something so clear as that, that, you know, you just glance at it and you can see it. It, you, it does it for a purpose. It's building a structure as an escape valve. Well, we ran up, the, the number for this quarter is in the mid $24 range to close a week out, $24.44 to be precise. January ran up to that same number, but closed the week out about 10 cents below it. Couldn't close the week out in the January rally above the zero line. Dropped back down under 22, we're back up at 24 again. So right now, this current rally in silver is trying to blow through this structure. When silver clears that momentum structure, it is very clear, very wide. It's a big base. Our bet is that silver price will, like a vacuum, rally up to the top end of the range of the last few years. There's a zone up there on the price charts. So you can see it. Peak weekly closes a couple times. have been around 28. Peak weekly highs have been around 30. So there's a little zone up there, $2 zone, where the highest and the weekly close, high, closing highs have been. We think if you cross our quarterly trend number, silver's going to rapidly move to the top end of that range. And we've warned our subscribers, if you want to sell it there, go ahead, but you'll be skewered. Okay? Because we think if you go back to those highs, you're going through. It may pause there. Uh, silver is overdue to regain value versus gold. We all know it's got squished after the 2011 peak. Its relative performance dropped. But when we measure relative performance of silver versus gold and run momentum studies of it, we see that silver is broken out versus gold. It's now in a positive performance trend versus gold. And we think that is a further wind at the back of silver, such that when it closes over that three-quarter average on the net momentum charts, it's got the wind at its back of being better performer than gold now. You have to measure it. You, you can't glance at the price charts to see that relative performance, by the way. And if you cross that quarterly momentum structure, we think silver's going to come to life. And I don't want to exaggerate, but it wouldn't shock me if silver behaved much like Bitcoin did a year or so ago when it went from 10,000 to 60,000 in about nine months. Um, I think that we could expect that kind of behavior from silver. Okay, we'll touch on a, a bunch of those things uh, that you just said in, in a bit. Uh, but with technical analysis, you know, it's, it's not a 100% prediction, but rather it's more of like a, a probability uh, being that silver seems to be sticking on the lower end of that 22 to $28, $30 range, the 22 23 24 level, would it get pulled down to the sub-20 level versus a breakout of above 28 in the short term? We thought there was a possibility of that <clears throat> during this quarter. 
In fact, it was a point at which gold, which already did some positives on its quarterly momentum in the fourth quarter of last year. But when gold did it, silver didn't agree. It didn't cross its structure. So we said, okay, hold on. We want silver to say, yes, I'm with you, gold. And it didn't. And sure enough, what happened to gold? Gold dropped from the high 1800s down into the 1700s again. It pulled back. Uh, <clears throat> and silver is still poised below its breakout structure. We want to see silver cross its structure because gold is already positioned positively to go. We want silver to echo that. Uh, there was a point at which, in that pullback from the November high in gold, we saw some vulnerability on gold monthly oscillators that suggested you could get a downside flush. In other words, if we're going to get one, the door was open for the bears to do it. They didn't do it. Two weeks after we put up our caution flag, we said, okay, caution flag is waved down. The chance to break the market is gone. And uh, sure enough, then gold firmed back up. So did silver from below 22 up to over 24 recently. So we think that that opportunity that you talked about, yeah, yeah, it was possible. But I think that opportunity opened and closed, and they didn't exploit it. So the bears had all their fundamental argument, you know, the Fed's going to do this and all that stuff. And yet now, you know, they're not making any money. No, silver hasn't exploded yet, but they're not making any money on the short side. Yeah, yeah that's a great point there. Uh, Michael, how did your momentum analysis perform in the last previous metals bull markets between 2000 and 2011? And are we seeing patterns that happened then that are repeating itself now? Yeah, we have been very good on long-term calls of gold. That is more or less the area that I began in. In 1975, I joined EF Hutton's commodity division and I studied under the chairman of the COMEX and that's when gold was legalized in 75. Uh, I, I started research in 92. I left the brokerage side and went into research. Uh, we sell to institutions and a lot of investors are research. But gold is my favorite market. It always has been my focus. We called the top in 2011, especially in January 2012. Gold was in the 1600s, a couple hundred off its high. We said, that's it, it's over. Gold fitfully tried to go up again until late 2012, and finally it just crashed in 2013, and the bear market really began. In 2016, it hit a low in late 2015 in December at $1,046 come down from 1910 to 1046, okay, in a couple years. When it turned up in February of 2016, annual momentum of gold, not evident on the price charts, but evident on annual momentum, blew through a three-year wide ceiling, thereby announcing, okay, annual momentum of gold is back into positive trend. Silver, of course, scooted up with gold at that point, had a huge rally into mid-2016. Gold never went back to its lows. It retested them in 2018, got that, I think, 1160, so about 100 bucks above its 2015 low. And then in late 2018, began to engage on the upside again. Uh, we added to our bullish position in late 2018. We put out a second major buy signal between 1160 and 1200. And basically, since then, nothing has changed in terms of our long term call on gold. We turned bullish in 2016 with an echo secondary signal late 2018. Nothing since then, despite sell-offs, so forth, has altered the annual momentum trend. It remains positive. And quite often when gold gets into an annual momentum trend, it might stay positive for a decade. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not like it's old. Also, if you go back and look at gold over history, the three prior major bull markets in gold since it was legalized, mid-70s. Each move has come from a bear market low to a bull market peak over a span of years that has been seven to eight-fold price increase from the bear market low. Okay, okay. our bull market began with a bear market low in 2015 at 1,050 roughly. Okay, what's seven to eight-fold? Okay, we've nowhere nearly matched the three prior major bull trends, and there's no reason to assume we can't. Now, if annual momentum turned negative, which it has not, we would say, okay, well, maybe it's over. But we have no reason to assume that long-term momentum of gold has turned. It's turned positive then, and it's still positive. Same with silver. Silver joined gold late. It joined it in 
July of 2019, no, excuse me, July of 2020, when it crossed through 1940. And it was immediately at 30 bucks. And since then, its annual momentum has remained positive, though we've had these pullbacks in silver. Nothing has broken the annual momentum uptrend of silver. So it remains positive. We think that the old relationship between silver and gold, and if you go back over that nearly 50-year period, 1970s to the present, you'll find there's four times that the silver price has reached 3% or higher of the price of gold. In fact, two of those times, it reached 6.5% and 4% the price of gold, and then two other times, reached over 3%. Well, silver right now is about 1.35% of the price of gold. And we're arguing, we think it's at least going to see 3% again, which it's seen four times in the last 40 plus years. So it's not like it's an irregular thing. Well, you do the math. If gold has a normal seven to eight fold bull market, and by the way, we think it might even be more than that this time. We think we're in the bull market of history for gold and silver because of monetary and technical factors that we see in other markets. If gold goes up to seven to eight thousand, seven fold to eight fold move again, a routine logarithmic move for gold, echoing the three prior bull markets, and silver went to 3%. Well, silver would be a couple hundred dollars. So don't be shocked because it's not abnormal to make such projections. If gold makes a routine logarithmic move like it did three times before, seven to eight fold move, and silver goes to a, where it's been four times before, 3% of the price of gold, then you could have gold at 8,000 and silver at 240. And it would simply be, oh, I've been here before. Okay. So we think the metrics for silver are dynamic, definable, and it's going to be like a slingshot effect where it's going to do a big catch up. Yeah, that silver slingshot. You know, a lot of guys would say that silver has has been sort of an underperformer, especially when they look at something like something like Bitcoin. Uh, they kind of feel like silver needs to get up to that $30, $35 price point, And then perhaps we may see silver hit that slingshot, have that Bitcoin moment. Does it need to get to that number? What what would take it? Well, it's, it, uh, the price guys will get excited, obviously, if you go up above 30, you know, because they can see the repeated highs in 2020 and early 21, where you got up to 28 to 30, 28 to 30, 28 to 30. So what we're saying is if you cross our quarterly momentum number in the mid 24s, <clears throat> you're likely to vault up to the top end of that stupid range. I call it stupid because anybody can see it. OK, it's not going to halt you again. You might pause there for a day or a week or whatever, but you're not going to get a major sell-off if you return to that upper end of that zone. You're going through. Then the question is, okay, where's next resistance? Well, there isn't any except $50 on a price chart basis I'm talking about. There were two peaks. You know, in history of silver, 50 bucks, 50 bucks. 2011 was the last time. So there's a void between 30 and 50 where there's really just nothing. There's no place to sell it. It's just an open window. And we argue if you ever see 50 again, you're going to get a triple top breakout. You know, so, but the key right now is to get silver over that quarterly momentum structure. And that's to say, you know, half a buck above the high we've been trading at recently. And do it on a weekly close. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because there's been a lot of guys in, in silver. They've been holding silver for quite some time. I, I hear them telling me if it ever gets back to 50, I'm going to sell it and let it go. What would you tell them? They'll be sorry. They'll be sorry. Because this we're in a historic move. We're, you shouldn't just look at gold and silver anymore. You've got to look at, well, for instance, the U.S. stock market is in the biggest bubble that it's ever seen in its history. And, you know, if that bubble breaks, and we think it's begun to break by our measurements, by our metrics, long-term metrics, if it begins to break, and I don't mean crash, because bear markets in the stock market rarely ever begin with crashes, only in 29. Did you start with a crash? Look at the 2000 top. Look at the 2007 top. They were arm wrestling matches. But if you now break that asset bubble and going with it will be muni bonds and high yield corporate debt, which are behaving terribly. OK, the Fed is going to panic. Those are the asset categories that defended in 2020 through 2021. They outright bought them. ETFs of high yield corporate debt, muni bond ETFs. If those start to break again. The Fed's going to have to come up with some excuse to cease to tighten and taper because it's their primary job to fund government. 
support government bonds. And uh, they've got a real problem with these asset categories breaking, even if sentiment, even if you got the S&P just 20% off its high, which is we think where it's going to go in the next low, we're down around 3,800 S&P. That's only 20% off the high, but you can imagine what public sentiment, asset manager sentiment is going to be like. Because a lot of asset managers out there perceive based on fundamentals that this market is way overvalued, like they've never seen. Well, the Fed cannot allow that asset category to implode. And if they don't, there's only one alternative they have. That's to revert back to monetary expansion and free money. And what does that benefit? Gold, silver. That's a great point there. Michael Oliver from OliverMSA.com. We appreciate the time you've given, and I hope we can do this again soon. And don't sell your silver, right? That's right. All right, Michael, appreciate it. And, and we'll, we can do this again soon sometime. That was Michael Oliver from OliverMSA.com sharing his views on the silver slingshot coming our way. As always, please leave your thoughts in the comment section below. And remember to keep it liquid, keep it real. And I'll see you on the next episode of Metal Money.